Okay, then, uh, all right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, today, you will learn something about WebAssembly for Java developers. My name is Thomas. Uh, I work for a company called Identity Tailor, which I founded, uh, just founded in April this year. I'm focusing on digital identities and all sorts of technologies around that. I'm one of the official Keycloak maintainers. If you are familiar with Keycloak, just uh, ping me afterwards. <laughs> um, I'm also working for the OpenID Foundation uh, and help them to um, implement the certification tests for the official OAuth and OpenID Connect protocols. And uh, I'm in my spare time, I also organize a Java user group, namely the Java user group in Saarland, in Saarbrücken, if you know. So if you happen to be in that area, please give it a visit. Give us a visit. We are doing meetups, regular meetups every month or so, and would be happy to have you there. And why I'm here today is, uh, well, I have a second passion, which is uh, I'm a huge WebAssembly fanboy, and I hope I can convince you to become one too. So, speaking of WebAssembly, quick question to the audience. Who of you have uh, knowingly used WebAssembly up to today? Oh, just one hand goes up. Okay, who of you is interested in WebAssembly, in doing it, applying it somewhere? Okay, some hands go up. Maybe let's see whether we can get more hands show up later. So, what is WebAssembly? Uh, to those who don't know, uh, WebAssembly, or WASM for short, is basically a binary instruction format for a so-called stack-based virtual machine. So it's just an intermediate language, so to speak, uh, like JVM bytecode, more or less. Yeah? But... Uh, with a more noble goal, which is uh, like in Java, write once, run anywhere. This also applies to WebAssembly, that you can write WebAssembly workloads on many different platforms and target architectures. Uh, how does it work? Well, you write your program in a source code in an arbitrary language like Python, Go, Ruby, Rust, or Java, or C, C++, and then you use a special compiler to translate your code into a WebAssembly artifact, or WebAssembly bytecode, so to speak. This bytecode is then feed into a runtime that you run on a target machine uh, for some operating system, or you embed a runtime in your application. Yeah? And with that, you can basically execute the logic that you compiled to into WebAssembly. Just as an example, let's see, let's imagine we have this small uh, function here, um, uh, that uh, add function that takes two int parameters and produces the sum as uh, returns the sum as a result. This can be translated into WebAssembly, and WebAssembly can be expressed in multiple different uh, forms. One form is the so-called WebAssembly text format, yeah, that is shown here. And WebAssembly text format is, uh, let's say, uh, similar to what you might have seen once uh, in other languages like Clojure or Lisp, yeah, or this, this so-called S expression syntax style is uh, representative for this kind of techniques. And you also see here the stack-based notion of this kind of machine. Yeah? You see we have this add function expressed here with two int parameters uh, that produces an integer result as a signature of the function. And then you see we load the parameter onto the local stack. Yeah? And then we call or an, an, an i32.add instruction, more or less, to pop, which pops the two values from the stack, computes the sum of those values, and places the result back on the stack again in order to be returned later on. But as said, this is only one representation that you could have. Uh, the most common way to use WebAssembly is to use the binary representation of this. And this is just an example here. And of course, there is tooling that allows you to translate this text-based format um, WebAssembly text into the binary one, or you can advise your compile, instruct your compiler to directly emit WebAssembly bytecode. Yeah? So that's possible. And you can, of course, turn WebAssembly bytecode back again into the textual representation for analysis, for instance. Yeah? Okay. Now that we have seen how that works in general, uh, let's see what are some benefits of WebAssembly and why should I care? Well, first of all, WebAssembly uh, is a portable technology, which means that it runs on every platform where there is a WebAssembly runtime written for it. Yeah? And nowadays, there are WebAssembly runtime for almost any platform that you can think of. Second, 
WebAssembly comes with safety built in mind. Uh, WebAssembly code is executed in a secured sandbox, a sandbox uh, that, uh, with uh, confined memory and bounded execution. So you can say, for instance, WebAssembly logic should use uh, no more than 100 kilobytes for this particular execution, and you can say the execution time is limited to that amount of time or to that amount of number of seconds, which gives you quite powerful capabilities like to avoid infinite loops and so on from code that you get from the outside world. And you can also specify which capabilities the, the bytecode should have in sense of should it be allowed to do network calls, file system access, or some other things? Yeah? You have much more powerful sandboxing capabilities than you have on the in, script, in script engines and so on, so on nowadays on the JVM. The third thing is it's polyglot, which means uh, since there are many languages, many different languages that compi can compile to WebAssembly, you can basically open up your application to be extended by uh, with uh, using different languages than the uh, language the application is written in. And it must not necessarily be a JVM language for that. And it's open, it's an open standard, it's uh, developed by major companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple and so on, and there is a wide adoption already of that technology. Uh, as one of the standards bodies that develops this uh, is, besides the V3C, is also the Bytecode Alliance. And the Bytecode Alliance is one of the non-profit organizations that take care of the uh, further development of the WebAssembly uh, standard, uh, the specification and so on, and interoperability technologies like the WebAssembly system interface, or WASI abbreviated. Uh, just a few words on WASI. WASI, you can think of WASI as the POSIX for WebAssembly. So what POSIX was to Linux and C is WASI to WebAssembly. Yeah? That gives you basically such a generic intermediate layer to, do, to interface uh, with, um, and do system calls on various target platforms. Okay, what are some use cases that you have for WebAssembly? Just real quick. Um, first of all, we have the opportunity to have language interoperability. As I said, I can write code in different languages than the, my application was written in. Um, I can use WebAssembly uh, for plugin systems. So ca I can make my system or application extensible by user code that is written in a different language and runs in a secure sandbox uh, in my application. Yeah? without requiring them to implement Java interfaces or whatever. Yeah? Um, and uh, this is one uh, of the prominent use cases that WebAssembly is used for, especially in the Java world nowadays. Um, you can also use this uh, in containerization, containerization contexts, um, like there are special container runtimes that can not only run Docker uh, image-based containers, but also just WebAssembly runtimes. And this is especially prominently used in the serverless space, where you have basic, can imagine that you have a serverless function as a WebAssembly module, and every time you send an HTTP request to an endpoint, a WebAssembly module is basically executed uh, and then uh, discarded afterwards again for every call. And the cool thing is, uh, this uh, comes with minimal uh, cold start times. Uh, there are WebAssembly-based um, uh, serverless uh, platforms out, out there that provide you with millisecond or even microsecond start time per invocation, like microsecond overhead to invoke uh, a WebAssembly logic, which is quite impressive, I would say. So I will not go here into much details because of time. So now the important question is, what's in for Java developers? Well. I already talked about, we have this notion of polyglot programming. We can run code written in other languages than our own application. And this allows programmers to provide features in their preferred language. You can extend a Java application with code that's written in Go, or in Python, or in, uh, in Rust, for instance. Yeah? You can use, of course, uh, WebAssembly to implement your own plugin systems to make your programs uh, extensible. And this can even be used as a more secure and even powerful uh, implement, uh, replacement for scripting engines yeah? because of the secure sandboxing and uh, the yeah, polyglot uh, programming paradigm that you can follow. Um, 
There is also uh, the of, uh, the notion of efficient and fast execution of WebAssembly workload. Uh, I already mentioned the fast cold start time, to in time to invoke uh, a WebAssembly logic, but um, there's also support for running logic in an interpreted mode to inspect instruction-wise execution, or even jittered mode that you get, as you know, the just-in-time compiler from Java, uh, you can leverage the just-in-time compiler capabilities of the JVM uh, to speed up code execution if it is executed often enough. Uh, also, the secure sandboxing model yeah, uh, gives us quite powerful capabilities. As said, we can uh, have uh, execute our WebAssembly workload with bounded memory and CPU, yeah, which is quite powerful if you, for instance, build a plug-in ecosystem that allows you all arbitrary um, companies to, to, to uh, uh, publish their, their, their WebAssembly extensions and you want to enable your customers to download uh, WebAssembly plugins from a marketplace or what. Yeah? With that, you can make sure that those uh, plugins can do no harm. And uh, since we can explicitly uh, configure which capabilities uh, these WebAssembly modules can have, we can also provide uh, quite powerful uh, execution environments for those uh, workloads. Like we can give, it, give them HTTP network access, we can give them file system access or operating system access in some sort. So, with that said, how does it now actually work? What, what can I do as a Java developer? Well. There are multiple options, of course, that you can have to run WebAssembly today in your Java applications. One of them is uh, WasmTime, or most precise, WasmTime Java. Um, WasmTime is basically the standard or go-to WebAssembly runtime that's basically governed by the Bytecode Alliance. This is basically the reference implementation of the WebAssembly spec, and all new features basically learn land, land first in the WASM, WASM time runtime and gets then ported to all the other available runtimes later on. Yeah? And there is a, a, a Java library, WASM time Java, um, which is basically just a wrapper around WASM time, which is written in Rust, and this Java library just uses Java native interface to basically call out uh, into this native library to provide you access to this. Yeah? I have some examples for this, but I only briefly show some code here. And that just that you get the idea for the general pattern, how you use this uh, kind of libraries. Uh, usually, you just instantiate uh, some kind of WebAssembly uh, engine, yeah, runtime engine. Then you load a WebAssembly module from, from a file, either in this WebAssembly text format or in the binary format. Um, and then you instantiate such a module. And once you have the module instantiated, you can basically call functions that are, or symbols that are exposed, or functions that are exposed as symbols from the uh, uh, WebAssembly module. Yeah? And in this case here, let's do it real quick in Java. Um, in this case here, I have a, a calc, uh, I have a sum wasm uh, file uh, that exposes a calc function that can basically uh, get compute the sum of two integer values. And you see here, I pass in the values three and four. And this will, of course, produce the result, expected result, seven. Yeah? And uh, this method uh, calc here, this was basically uh, just exposed by this, this binary file here, as you can see, it's binary, you can't read it, but I also have the text representation of that, that looks like that. And here you see the exported symbol, which was calc, which is basically just an alias for the local add function, and so on. Yeah? So, of course, this is just the intermediate format that we have. So you don't write that by hand, although you can, but that's basically just what the compiler produces. So, this is basically um, what's happening here. Yeah. And here for later on, I have uh, the example for reference. Um, however, this, as you can see, this is quite low level. Yeah? You pass in here the primitive data types, and as you, if you are familiar with WebAssembly, uh, you are pr pretty limited in what kind of data types you have. Mostly it's about integer and floating point numbers and raw memory. That's basically it. Yeah? You don't have a string representation directly and so on. Yeah? So it's all pretty low level. Now the question is, with such a low level interface, how can I do anything meaningful with it? Well, for that, uh, software exists like the XTISM uh, plugin framework, which basically provides you with a wrapper around this native and low level APIs that allows you to write nice high level 
uh, structures and pass them into the uh, WebAssembly um, workload and execute them and interpret the results properly. So, and there is also, of course, a Java SDK available for that, which I am one of the authors of. So, <laughs> this is quite powerful that you can use it uh, to write WebAssembly workload in all those languages here listed. And you can then use the XTism plugin framework to basically call that logic from Java. What you have here, uh, what it gives you is, uh, as I said, the it gives you a plugin SDK, uh, which uh, is effectively. Uh, using, a, again, a wrapper around wasm time, but this time invoked via JNA, Java Native Access, the more modern version of uh, uh, JNI, let's say, with some basic support for WASI even, uh, even, that you can interface with your environment and so on and do HTTP calls from WebAssembly workloads if you want. Um, it provides you with the capabilities for flexible data exchange. You can give uh, data, provide data um, from the host application, which is your Java app, in form of JSON object, let's say, um, into the WebAssembly module, which is then processed, and then you can use the WebAssembly uh, yeah, plugin integration libraries to, to read that JSON data and to work on it. Uh, it's quite easy to use, as you will see in a second. Um, and it's secure by default because it leverages the WebAssembly sandbox that is provided by the WASM time environment. With the one caveat that we have to use this native library that is, uh, needs to be shipped with it. Yeah? And as you can see, this is basically how it looks like in practice. Um, we have our uh, code uh, as well, WebAssembly um, that we load. Uh, um, in, this, in a form of manifest, as they call it, and then we create a plugin. Yeah, because uh, in Xtism everything is no sh uh, centered around a plugin, and here I can create a plugin instance from this WebAssembly code workload, and then uh, I can basically say plugin call this exported function with this given input. Yeah, the input here is just a simple string, and uh, we can run it and output a message. Yeah. If we look at that real quick, we have here the XTism program. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is basically what we have. And this WebAssembly module here just basically counts the vowel, vowels that we have uh, in this string. In this case, it says here, hello world contains three vowels, E, O, and O, yeah? and uh, gives us the response back as a JSON string. So that's the thing. We, the input for the plugin SDK is basically a JSON string. Uh, um, and the output is, again, a JSON string that you have to pass and map to your own Java objects. But this is the basic interface that it allow gives you there. It's quite simple, but uh, powerful still. But you can go one step further. Uh, as I said, uh, you can also use your own data structures. Yeah? Here I use a record, for instance. Um, uh, with two input parameters, A and B, and uh, an out custom record with that captures an output value. Yeah. And here I have, again, this add-like function, um, but uh, as a WASM, expressed as a WASM module. And this time, this is basically expressed as a Rust uh, in Rust. Yeah. And here you see, uh, I also have here a representation in a Rust-specific way for my input data types, like here the input with two values, A and B, and the output value. Uh, with some Rust-specific mappings, so to speak. And since I use the XSYSM plugin development kit infrastructure, or macro magic in Rust, uh, all the plumbing with deserializing JSON into these data structures and returning them back uh, into JSON is done automatically for me. Yeah? And this library, here's the, the sum function, as you can see. Um, and yeah, if I just run that, you still, it still sees that, you still see that OK, I create here uh, with a just a Jackson object mapper. I can uh, turn my uh, record into JSON, pass in the JSON value into the uh, plugin call. It does its thing and returns a JSON object again, uh, a JSON string again, which I read then uh, into my custom cars. And then I can work on it as I am used to do with general Java data structures. Yeah? That's what I get with the XTism plugin framework. All right. Um, this extension plugin framework is quite powerful, um, as we will see maybe later on. Um, but 
uh, the one downside of the Exism plugin framework is that it is still a wrapper around this native library, wasn't time, right? Um, but how cool would it be if there were a Java library that lets, would allow you to execute WebAssembly workload directly on the JVM? And guess what? There is. This is the Chicory runtime, which is a pure JVM native Java WebAssembly runtime um, that's been around for, let's say, a year or so in development. It's initiated by the folks behind the Exism project because they also thought that, hmm, how cool would it be if we could get rid of this native library dependency? Um, this was inspired by other projects like the Vaziro uh, uh, project, for instance. Vaziro is uh, uh, zero dependency impl implementation of a WebAssembly runtime in Go. Yeah? And um, before that, there were many attempts to bring WebAssembly to the JVM. And uh, it turned out that implementing the WebAssembly specification is quite hard. And the thing is, uh, the project Shikori uh, came together by many J WASM and JVM enthusiasts uh, joined for joining forces and with a with combined goal to provide the implementation for the standard WebAssembly runtime. And I'm happy to be also part of that little team. So now you might ask, Shikori, uh, a pure Java WASM runtime, why? Well, I already mentioned that uh, yeah, having to ship a native WebAssembly runtime is, might be not good, a good idea for many uh, use cases. Uh, although it's highly performant, uh, uh, it's still uh, platform specific. So you have to ship the right library for every platform that you target. Uh, and uh, this might be a burden for some. And uh, a JVM-based language native runtime can do all sorts of other magic things. It can leverage the JVM JIT. It, it requires no native libraries. It pr can still provide the sandbox within the JVM boundary. And it's much easier to interface with. And uh, just as a small example, this is what code with Chicory looks like. As you can see, as with the previously shown pattern, you can just instantiate uh, a module uh, that where you load your WebAssembly workload. Then you uh, fetch one of the exported symbols. And then you uh, yeah, construct your structures as before, uh, construct your input, and uh, call the add function with that and uh, under, uh, extract or uh, process the output, and there you go. Yeah. Just that you see that this works. Uh, uh, let's see that. Yeah, if I just run that. And this requires no native library. You can already execute WebAssembly workload on the JVM. So far, so good. But this is just a primitive example, right? What can we do else? Well, uh, WebAssembly is quite powerful. Uh, or Chicory is quite powerful because we can also call, uh, call Java methods from WebAssembly modules, yeah? um, which is quite nice because now um, we can have generic um, a WebAssembly module that does a certain thing and have it call out or call back into a host environment again to process some context-specific data and so on that we don't want to provide or expose in the WebAssembly workload. Yeah, which gives you quite powerful execution capabilities. Um, I'm going to uh, skip a demo for that. But the thing is, with that, what I've shown you real quick, uh, what's the point? Well, uh, why so low level still? Well, the, the, the current approach of the project is to provide the capability first and convenience later. Later on, once we have all the basic and primitives implemented, we will also provide you with some high-level APIs like you are used to from the Spring uh, ecosystem and so on. And uh, uh, you will see that um, the WebAssembly ecosystem, if you work in with that a little bit, you see that it is evolving quite quickly. There are a lot of specifications around that that uh, gets regularly updated, and uh, it's sometimes really hard to keep track on what's, what's working, uh, what's going on. Um, yeah, but still, there are some high-level APIs already on the horizon, and it's quite powerful already, and I hope I can convince you with that. Question is, as it is always, can it run Doom? And the answer is, yes, of course. Um, let me show you Shikori running Doom implemented in WebAssembly. Here I have the Doom WASM file. Uh, let me quickly open that. Open in terminal. And 
as I said, this is just one one class, a Doom class with a main method that runs uh, that loads the WebAssembly module, uh, loads here Doom Wasm, yeah, with zero native dependencies, nothing. And uh, if I now do this, you see it runs Doom, and not only the menu, no, no, it really works. And by the way, this is currently the, the raw speed on my machine, and this is just running in interpreter mode. Guess what would we be able to achieve when, it, when we finally reach the JIT compilation support? Yeah? Then you can run it in nearly native speed, and with that, uh, you can see and imagine that you can do quite powerful stuff already. So you can use it to, to run uh, code implemented in C, for instance, uh, in your JVM, without uh, yeah, requiring a native library and so on. Uh, yeah, so you see it works. <laughs> okay, that was the Doom thing. And uh, if you want to try it out yourself, um, um, there is an easy way to do that. Um, you can, bo for instance, just run, where is it? Where did I place it? Shikuri Demo, Shikuri Doom. Um, um, you can, if you have uh, uh, JBang installed, JBang is basically a command line launcher for all arbitrary Java tools and so on. But when you have JBang ins bang installed, you can basically launch the demo with one line, <laughs> like so, and it will automatically download and execute Doom, <laughs> which is quite cool. Um, with that said, my summary is for that. Uh, um, WebAssembly support is on the JVM already here, and it's here to stay. Um, there are many powerful integration options available already, and uh, JVM native implementations are on the rise. We are hardly, we are strongly working towards that goal. Um, yeah, better developer experience will be a game changer once we have these high-level APIs that all you can easily use WebAssembly workload uh, as you are used to from other uh, APIs like Quarkus or, or frameworks like Quarkus or Spring. And I hope I could convince you that WebAssembly has potential beyond the browser with that. And with that, I have, I let me now say thank you. And one last question, who of you is now uh, more, more um, willing to inspect what WebAssembly can do in the JVM than before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few more hands go up than before. And thank you very much and enjoy your conference.